you know, it's funny, I, I don't consider myself a single molecule person, but I ended up kind of looking at single molecules a little bit. So we're doubling into this. Um, I'll try to take you through a journey very slowly. I will introduce a few things. You're very welcome to ask questions on the way. The slide behind me is a fluorescence microscopy image of neurons in the brain of a live animal. It's not our data. I put it up to try and uh, illustrate a point. Um, the brain has about 100 million neurons, the brain of an adult human. Each neuron has about 10 connections to each other. Trillion connections. This is pretty much the same number as the number of stars in the observable universe, right? The brain is a very complex organelle. For that reason, we understand very, very few things about how it works, uh, despite, despite of the fact that it's so important for us. Now, in, a, in any given cell, you're going to find proteins expressed at the, let's say, typically 1,000 or 10,000 copies per cell. So we, we have in this organ, for each different kind of protein, we're finding it in quadrillion copies. When you realize that, as a single molecule person, you kind of become a little bit... <laughs> you know, disenchanted about the utility of your own work. Because basically, when you do single molecule experiments, when you're looking at the function of a protein at the single molecule level, which is what I'm going to show you today, invariably, what you're observing is that the function of a protein over time is not stable, but it's kind of stochastic. It fluctuates at different time scales. And these kind of fluctuations appear to be very important mechanistically because that's how the molecules intrinsically, that's how they work. But in my opinion, now, the big question for the field, uh, one I'm, I'm trying to answer myself every day with, uh, when I wake up is, find this, what, what is the biological role of these fluctuations? In other words, if I change the amplitude of these fluctuations, or their frequency without changing the average, would a cell that is carrying 1,000 of these copies know? Would the brain that is carrying uh, 10 to the 15 copies ever know the difference? And the answer is really not at all clear. There have been a few single molecule systems where stochastic fluctuations appear to be very important in biology and stochastic gene expression is one of them. But it has been very hard to add, you know, members in this very exclusive family. And today I'm gonna to share with you some of our very recent and published data on a, a molecule that is called uh, the VATPAs, where we feel that we have established a connection between single molecule stochastic behavior and some second, third order system-wide effects for neurotransmission. All right, so I'm, I'm writing here, whoops, let's go back, that the, the brain VTPAs is a powerhouse in, in synaptic transmission. And what does that mean? Uh, it means that the brain VTPAs is energizing synaptic vesicles. Synaptic vesicles are nanocontainers. They're literally 40 nanometers in diameter. And they are the containers that are carrying neurotransmitters. And for neurons to communicate with each other, these neurotransmitters have to escape synaptic vesicles. The VTPAs is the molecule that is making sure Synaptic vesicles are loaded with neurotransmitters. It provides the proton gradient and electrochemical gradient that is providing the energy for loading the synaptic vesicles with neurotransmitters. Now, it's a very weird system because there is only one copy of the VTPAs per single synaptic vesicle. Now, if there is you know, a, a bona fide single molecule system in biology, 
You know, if there is such a thing, this is it. Uh, because there is only one copy per synaptic vesicle, people have canonically assumed that this molecule would likely not exhibit pronounced stochasticity, because if it would, this would translate in stochasticity at the loading of synaptic vesicles. That would, could be catastrophic potentially, right? But no one has ever done these measurements, and that's what I'm going to show you today. And really, I'm going to summarize all the findings on this slide, so the ones that are not super excited about that can drift off afterwards. And the findings are as following. The VATPase does not work continuously in time as has been hypothesized until now. As a matter of fact, it stalls. It stops pumping protons. And these periods of inactivity can last from minutes to hours. It also goes into other types of molecular states that are actually leaky to protons. So they collapse these energy uh, electrochemical gradients that are driving the loading of neurotransmitters, which is even more problematic. And then stochastically, it will resume the cycle. It's a reversible stochastic cycle and go back into working, sleeping, resting, pretty much like we all do, so to speak. The other thing I will tell you is that this cycle is subject to regulation. So if you want to regulate overall, modulate the activity of this molecule, you don't do it in an analog manner. You cannot really tune it and dial up the way it actually works. The only thing you can do is, because this molecule is essentially a switch, is a molecular switch. It oscillates between activity and inactivity. You can just change the probabilities to find it in these two different states or the liquid state for that matter. The third thing I will tell you today is that kind of obvious, because there's only one molecule in a, in, a, in a single synaptic vesicle, the stochasticity it exhibits propagates to the way the synaptic vesicle works now as an autonomous nanoscale uh, system. All right. The work that I will talk about was done by collaboration between our group and the groups of Reinhard Jan and Julia Priobazhensky in Göttingen. They are the experts in synaptic vesicles and they provided us with the samples. Our group has been doing the method development, image acquisition, data acquisition, data analysis. And the data we'll show you today were really all collected and analyzed by a fantastic student, Eleftherios Cosmidis, has spearheaded this project and has been assisted by Chris, Mas, and Alex in this endeavor that has lasted, you know, six or seven years, uh, 30, 30, 40 man years in total for everyone concerned. The first part of my presentation will be introductory slides, make sure we all get the concepts right. And the second part will be uh, focused on this small story, you know, one small story that I, I would ideally like you to take home with and to have something very concrete to remember out of this presentation today. So yeah, just one slide to say that my lab is in general developing methods to study proteins and membranes on the very small scales. So we are method driven. Occasionally that brings us down to the level of single molecules, but most of the time we are looking at ensembles of molecules, tens of hundreds of thousands of molecules. That has been, uh, most of the, our work has been uh, in this scale. The data I'll show you today are somehow integrating these two different length scales. And in the future, most of the current projects that we're working on now are uh, looking at heterogeneity within cells and in between cells. But uh, these are all projects that are running uh, actively at the moment. Okay, one very general concept that uh, everybody should be familiar with to move all along is that, you know, cells are not homogeneous distribution of molecules. There is special organization. This is absolutely crucial for a cell to create compartments that have specific functions like the nucleus, you know, where the genome is stored, or I don't know, like the lysosomes or proteins are degraded and so on. These compartments are defined by membranes. And that's absolutely important. Otherwise, they, if, if the composition is not defined by, the, by membranes that create a barrier that contains molecules, identity cannot be de defined. So membranes are barriers to molecules especially 
charged or polar molecules. They confine them and that creates the identity of organelles, like synaptic vesicles for that matter, that you will hear about today. The reason why the membranes of cells are barriers is because to solutes is because they have a hydrophobic core, which is made out of hydrocarbons. It's very oily. So anything that is charged has a very low partition coefficient. All right. So this is the way how membranes uh, are able to trap molecules within organelles, uh, like synaptic vesicles, for example. The other concept that is very important uh, to get out from today is that membranes are passive barriers. They don't allow things to, 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 to go across the membrane, but something else needs to establish concentration gradients you know, for things to differentiate in their content. And the molecules that are doing that are called active transporters. They are molecules that are using energy to establish gradients. And one of the most frequent source of energy that is used is ATP. If ATP is hydrolyzed from triphosphate to diphosphate, the energy released can be used by transporters to establish gradients. As is illustrated in this diagram. We're gonna talk a lot about gradients of ions across the membranes. So in this case, the VTPase is a, is, a, is a molecule that is using ATP to establish gradients of protons. Now, once the gradients are established, there is another class of proteins called channels that open up a pore that is very hydrophilic. So charged molecules can just permeate through down the concentration gradient. That's a, a, you know, it's a process that dissipates energy, doesn't require energy to happen. And be, for that reason, channels are much, much faster than transporters. Transporters work against concentration gradients. They are about five orders of magnitude slower. Channels are important because they were the first molecules that already in the 70s, they were studied at the single molecule level. Their function, their activity was studied at single molecule level with a, with a technique that's called patch clamp that was awarded the Nobel Prize in 91. Uh, the way patch clamp works is you have a glass pipette that has a very small aperture. You can use it to go on the surface of the cell and really isolate single ion channels. And then if you apply a voltage, you can measure the currents, the ionic currents. These are not electrons, these are ions that are flowing in water, right? Uh, and, you know, you can measure very small currents down to the picoampere range. The, the, the limit in the noise it is in these recordings at room temperature is about 0 0.1 picoamperes, which is very fortunate because channels have currents from one to 10 to 100 picoamperes, so they can be readily resolved with patch club. The problem with transporters, of, as I said before, is that they are 10,000 times slower. So patch club cannot resolve their activity, the currents they are generating at a single molecule level. So to do that, we had to come up with an alternative method. The method is actually in principle, very simple. I think I'm gonna skip this slide. And it's using nanocontainers. The reason why we're using nanocontainers is because they have very small volumes, the order of one attoliter, 10 to the minus 18 liters. So the very small volume, what it does, it artificially increases concentrations. If you put one ion inside this volume, you already have micromolar concentrations. If you put thousand, you have millimolar, right? So, Containers like that, very small containers have been used for many decades to look at transport rates that are very, very low. But typically people have been using them in an ensemble of containers, containing thousands, millions of containers, millions of molecules. The thing that we did differently was to actually take them out of solution and put them down on a surface far apart from each other so that we can do microscopy on them at individual uh, nanocontainer level, right? This has been sort of our bread and butter for our group and we've been doing that for many decades and we're very good at it. And if on the average there is one transporter in such a container, then we can do activity measurements on one molecule. And of course, because there are many, there are thousands, tens of thousands within our field of view, we do these measurements in parallel. So we, we, 
we take movies, we can absolutely go in and zoom inside these containers and follow them over time, analyze the data and extract the currents of individual transporter molecules. Now, one, one comment I would like to make is that even though we're looking at the activity of, uh, whoops, of uh, one transporter, we're using thousands of fluorophores to report these changes, hundreds to thousands. We're using fluorophores whose quantum yield is sensitive to the concentration of ions. This could be pH indicators, or it could be indicators for calcium or sodium or potassium ions. So the system has an intrinsic amplification encoded into it, which allows us to look at molecules, single molecules for periods of hours. So you traces over three hours. Now we do 12 and 15 hours in the lab. All right. And then another introductory slide to just recap the, the fact that the communication between new, two neurons is not happening through physical contact, is happening through neurotransmitters that are released in the synaptic cleft, and they by diffusion approach the second neuron. And this before release, they are stored inside single synaptic vesicles. And single synaptic vesicles are carrying actually on the average 1.2 copies of the VATPase. This is the molecule that is shown here in blue. And the VATPase is responsible for establishing the energy gradients that are driving the loading of neurotransmitters, of all different types of neurotransmitters, synaptic vesicles, a real single molecule system. Uh, the VATPase have been studied for a long time. It's a molecule that is actually very, very large. It's 14 by 25 nanometers, its dimensions. It's a rotary mechanoenzyme. So it has a stationary part that is embedded in the membrane and a shaft that rotates as the VTPase hydrolyzes ATP. And this point of contact there between the C ring that rotates and the stationary uh, subunit here is the point where protons are being shuttled across the membrane in a unidirectional manner. Is actually after ion channels is the first class of molecules that have ever been studied at a single molecule level. That was work that was done by Japanese groups, Kinosita, especially in the late 80s and 90s. But it was work that was done only with the soluble part of the molecule. And they were looking really at the rotation as a function of ATP. So we really have measured this at the single molecule level, but what we've never done is reconstitute the entire molecule. We've never looked at transport, at, which is the physiological function of this molecule. All right. So we've, we looked at synaptic vesicles in a very similar way, like I explained already, by putting them down on a glass slide at very low densities. The problem we had was that we had to introduce fluorophores in there to detect the ions that the VTPase was pumping. The way we introduced fluorophores is by fusing the synaptic vesicles with vesicles that we had made artificially and that contain, contain the fluorophores inside. Uh, that's a technical uh, detail to some extent. And then what we were left with was a vesicle that what we, what we called a hybrid synaptic vesicle that had the entire proteome of the synaptic vesicle oriented in the right way, including the VTPase and the fluorophores that allowed us to monitor the pumping of protons inside the lumen of, of, this, of this synaptic vesicle. Now, if we do an ensemble of hundreds or thousands of these vesicles, we observe curves that look a little bit like that. There is the, the whole population is silent until we're adding ATP, which is the fuel for this reaction. As we add ATP, we observe the pumping of protons and the acidification of synaptic vesicles. And uh, at a certain point, when we add a specific inhibitor of the VATPase, the, we see that the proton gradients are collapsed completely. And this is telling us that the signals we're recording are really originating specifically from the VATPase, even though the sample that we're looking at has hundreds of other transporters and channels in it, right? Now, if we look at the sample at the single synaptic vesicle, single VATPase level, over a period of time, what we observe, contrary to the uh, 
canonical uh, belief, we observe stochasticity. So the acidification of the synaptic vesicle is actually not stable over time, but it fluctuates between uh, periods of activity and, and inactivity. If we look a little bit more closely to the data, we see that as a single VTPase is working over time, it's pumping protons, it's reaching an equilibrium. This is an equilibrium where the pumping of protons in the vesicle equals the passive efflux of protons through the membrane because protons have a finite passive permeability through membranes. And if it stops, then protons leak passively through. Then it can start stochastically at, a, at, at some point working again. But occasionally we see that the efflux is actually very fast. We were wondering whether it's a, pro, a property of the protein or, or, or the membrane or, or and the, the way there are many different controls that led us to the conclusion this is a property of the VTPase. But the one I'm showing you here is plotting a histogram of these leakage times. In gray, you see the leakage times of the VTPase as it's working. And you see there are slow and fast leakage times with a different probability. If we block specifically the VTPase with an inhibitor, we see that we lose the fast leakage times, right? So the sample is are we otherwise the same? All other proteins are there. The VTPase is also there, but it's just not active anymore. And this fast leakage doesn't manifest anymore, right? So we uncover a, a new mode, two new modes, an inactive mode where the VTP is not working at all, and a mode where it actually becomes leaky, where the, the, the gradients it establishes are collapsing. And that's what I'm summarizing here, the, 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 the few different modes. Now it's important to understand, maybe it's completely obvious that if you're doing an ensemble average experiment, the ensemble average current that you're recording, it does not reflect the actual current that the molecule is working with. You have to normalize for the probability to find the molecule in an active state. And you also very importantly have to uh, subtract the probability and the currents that are leaking out. So ensemble average measurements of function for these molecules, which has been the canonical way to study them, you know, are actually convoluting a number of stochastic processes and effects that are happening. Now, one of the most interesting things is, you know, are these stochastic effects subject to regulation? Can they be modulated by something? And here I'll show you one of the experiments we did where we did something very simple. We titrated the concentration of ATP. ATP is the fuel for this cycling, for this rotation of the molecule, right? So the canonical understanding is that the more ATP you add, the faster the VATPase works and the larger currents it actually creates. That would be an ensemble average type of trace where we see an ensemble of many single molecules as we increase the concentration of ATP, we see they establish larger and larger acidification gradients, right? But when we break this data down to the single molecule level, what we see is that the amplitudes of these currents are actually not changing significantly with ATP concentration, right? And we can do the statistical analysis on this. And you see that we can go a factor of 10 above or below the michaelis mendens of this enzyme. So the broad range of physiological ATP concentrations and the amplitude of these currents are actually not changing at all. You have to go way down to 10 micromolar to so diffusion limited binding of ATP to the molecule to start seeing small effects on the currents, right? This is completely counterintuitive and it goes against, you know, decades of VATPase enzymology uh, this, this data. What is happening in the sample is that the concentration of ATP is actually regulating the mode switching probability. It's regulating the probability the VATPase exists in an active mode, it goes from the off switch to the on switch. And this has been the underlying mechanistic reason why in macroscopic experiments, people observe higher gradients right? It's because the molecule spends more time pumping protons. 
and then there are some controls. But basically what these experiments are telling you is that we don't have any more, we, we should not be looking at this system as an analog switch where the ATP concentration can dial the currents. The currents appear to be stable over a broad range of ATP concentrations. The system is, operates more like a switch and the concentration of ATP is actually re regulating the switching probability. Now, another thing that physiologically is very important because this molecule, its job is to create electrochemical gradients, right? It, its job is to energize the inside, pump protons inside synaptic vesicles, create a gradient of charge, of positive charges, and a gradient of, of ions, of, of, of protons, a chemical gradient, change the pH. And this is what is driving the secondary active transport of all other neurotransmitters. There's been a lot of discussion of whether there are positive or negative feedback loops, whether the establishment of these gradients affects in some way the activity of the VETPAs. But as I showed you, ensemble average measurements, because they're convoluting a number of different types of stochastic processes, some of them which are going against each other, are not the best to try and get insight in, into this kind of uh, processes. So we did a simple experiment where we are letting the VETPAs acidify, and then we're using chloride to collapse the electrical part of this gradient. Right? So we we're, we're trying to untangle the electrical from the chemical contribution of these gradients and understand now at the single molecule, at the stochastic level, what are, what are their effects? So we, we break down the ensemble traces into single molecule traces, and we can go out and do statistics on this data. So in this graph here, I'm showing you the maximum amplitudes of the single molecules. And actually, this is the first time anyone has ever made these observations. And we see that collapsing the electrical part of the gradient is actually allowing the molecule to work faster. It has a bona fide effect on the single molecule pumping rates, the way people canonically assumed. So this is really what's happening at the single molecule level. But electrochemical gradients have a lot of other secondary effects on the stochastic switching probabilities. Here, for example, I'm showing you the, del the dwell time on the active state, on the state where the molecule is actually working. That's T on uh, and also at the T off, at the inactive state. And what you see is that, how does that go now? That uh, I always confuse that releasing the electrochemical gradient, which is the operation going from black to, to red, is actually changing both on and, on and on off times. It doesn't actually change overall the probability, but independently, it regulates both on and off times. And we can also break this down as a function of pH, in the presence or absence of the electrical component of the gradient. And we see, for example, that pH also has a, is in its own right, a very potent regulator of T on. And then now the electrical component, in addition, can regulate T on even more. What that means is essentially there is a positive feedback loop that is encoded in the system. Once the VDB starts working, it successfully establishes an electrochemical gradient, it will continue working. And if it doesn't see an electrical gradient established, it has a tendency to stay inactive. We speculate that this is a way for the VTPAs to save energy because this molecule is one of the larger sources of ATP consumption in the brain. The leakage probability is a parameter that doesn't seem to affect, uh, to have a, a, potent, a potent uh, uh, regulation uh, uh, due to electrochemical gradients. Now, I talked about these experiments, uh, you know, from the perspective of the VTPAs, but because the system is actually within the context of the synaptic vesicle, the, the stochasticity that we're actually measuring is stochasticity at the synaptic vesicle as as, a, as an autonomous uh, system. So classically, if you would observe acidification over time of a sample, uh, 
you would see progressively as time was passing by, the sample was acidifying more and more. You were establishing the gradients that are driving the loading of neurotransmitters. And people always assumed that at the single vesicle level, this happened homogeneously. The probability was always one to kickstart acidification in synaptic vesicles and progressed uniformly over time with same kinetics. So the model that our data are now suggesting is a stochastic model and a synchronous model. If you look at individual synaptic vesicles as they acidify over time, you see a lot of them are completely silent. Stochastically, some of them might acidify, but there are also a probability that they're gonna switch off over time. And at equilibrium, 40% of the vesicles are never acidified. They never establish an electrochemical gradient. They are never able to load neurotransmitters, right? So th that's very important in the context of, of neurotransmission because what you have is, if the, this would be the, the membrane of the presynaptic cleft, synaptic vesicles are formed through the influence of clathrin. And once they're formed, the next thing that they have to do are both clathrin coating is they have to be loaded with neurotransmitters. And that's absolutely crucial because if they are, they are not loaded, then they have nothing to release in the synapse. And our data are suggesting that up to 40% of synaptic vesicles are not able to drive loading with neurotransmitters. They are not able to load, right? When they fuse at the synapse, they have nothing to release. They have no information content to, release, to deliver to the, to the next neuron cell. That is very important because that is actually regulating the strength of the synaptic transmission. The strength of the synaptic transmission is absolutely crucial for forming memory and plasticity of neurons, right? So we have a system where single molecule stochasticity is manifesting in the function of a small organelle and is very likely to affect neural and communication. With that, I would like to summarize again. I repeated these things many times, but our primary observation is that the VTPase does not pump protons continuously time. It actually switches between three different ultra slow modes, a proton pumping and inactive, and also a proton leaking mode. And ATP, surprisingly, contrary to the canonical uh, paradigm, does not regulate the pumping rates of the molecule. It solely regulates the mode switching probability. This stochasticity propagates in the system because of a very special property the system has, which is only one copy of a VTPase per single synaptic vesicle. Be very interesting to understand whether this type of mode switching is subject, is manifesting with other types of transporters. We've done measurements with other types of proton pumping enzymes, but the proton pumping pathway is actually very highly conserved along different families. So it is really not clear whether other primary active transporters that have very different ion transport mechanisms will actually exhibit similar types of observations so of, of processes. So that, that's something we're very much interested in actively working on. And in general, you know, single molecule compartmentalization is not a unique property of the synaptic vesicle system. It's happening a lot throughout the cell especially at the plasma membrane where proteins are isolated in very small nanodomains. That's another area that we're very much interested in to understand how compartmentalization now within the planes of membranes in two dimensions, what kind of secondary effects it has into, into signaling. And that's something we're looking on with molecules like Gpron couple receptors. I've already acknowledged the, the people and the, that did the work and the collaborators. It's very important to acknowledge also the Novo Nordisk Foundation that has uh, provided financing for this work. 
long-term stable financing that allows to do a bit more risky and exploratory work in the, within the center of geometrically engineered cellular systems. With that, I would like to end. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. Thank you, Dimitri. I think it was a really excellent talk. I, I'm also happy to see so much unpublished data. I think it was quite impressive. And the floor is open for discussions. We have very slow questions. and relaxing. Uh, like Torben said, excellent talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, there's another effect regarding um, the stochasticity of the release following the different amount of loadings, which is uh, synaptic vesicle uh, clustering near the synapse. So it would be maybe interesting in the future also to test um, what's the relation between the exocytosis machinery that regulates the release and the level of, of uh, production or the amounts of uh, dopamine, let's say, uh, Absolutely. The, the, there's already ensemble average data that suggest loading and exocytosis appear to be correlated. But so there, there is reasons why, you know, your, your suggestion is actually a very good one. Because, you know, what you're, and another thing that's very important is that, you know, these synaptic vesicles were isolated and pulled out of the cell and imaged on the surface, right? So we make some observations that we extrapolate about how things happen in a cell, but you know, we don't really know. And that's where this type of measurements should move in the future. That, that's a corollary of, you know, of your observations that I fully embrace. And I think it's a very important thing to do. Yeah, a really fantastic talk. Um, so many questions, I don't know where to start really, but um, a key question for me was like, why do 40% not load at all? I mean, I don't, didn't understand what is the point is this, or is it also like, I mean, at, at the end you still have an artificial model system, so you cannot, you cannot capitulate all sorts of um, organization and also of controlling the system. Is that part of it? Or do you believe it's true 40% are never loading? Okay, so the data I've showed you now were done with what we call hybrid synaptic vesicles. In the meantime, we we'll also work with intact synaptic vesicles. They are intact synaptic vesicles that have been purified from the cell, but they are intact. That's kind of the closest anyone has ever been to this type of measurements. I'm not gonna put my hand into, into a burning oven that this is what happens in a cell, but our data suggests this is a, this is a property of, of the VTPAs that is likely to, to take place in a cell. So I, I would speculate at this stage that this is happening also in an intact cell. I don't know, but I would speculate. It, it, does the, the, the magic number 40% have any significance? I don't know. This is our observation. You know, L Very likely the way we see ATP concentration modulates its probability, a very other parameters of soluble molecules that are present in the synapse could regulate it they could conceivably push it to one, you know, maybe not, we don't know. Yeah, beautiful. I have two questions related to the questions that I've been asked. The first would be, why would you expect that the rate would increase with ATP? I, I, we know that these molecules have a maximum rotation rate, then there's three ATP per, per round. So above 900 ATP per second. I can answer cannot... that question. It's very simple because the single molecular rotation measurements yeah. over this range of ATP concentrations have observed the speed to increase. Yeah, so the good. molecule is rotating faster. And I didn't kind of break this down to I th what is happening. I think the rate limiting step is not at the rotation is at the coupling of the rotation to transport. And that rate limit stem is happening very early on, up, you know, 10 times below the KM of, of ATP. Mm. So it's surprising because people until now have assumed very good coupling between rotation and, and pumping. And that's what we, we see really. We see this coupling is horrible and it imposes the rate limiting step in function, which is the important thing. Yeah, my, my second question would be, 
related to the let's say 40 percent or so i mean in in the in the native system obviously the proton gradient is used to charge the vesicles with with uh, neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters right which re relates basically to a release of that proton gradient you never reach uh, reach that that membrane potential so no that's it, not true the the vtps is is like so powerful that it, it pretty much maintains on the average but a case, pH gradient of a few units. Yeah, but my case would be that each one of these vesicles that reaches this type of, of level ones, even if it leaks at some point, the neurotransmitters would be charged, right? If it reaches. Ah, that's a ones. very good question. Very good question. So it's all about uh, the, the relative, um, the, the ratio between. Um, the kinetics of the stochastic kinetics of triggering acidification and the lifetime of the synaptic vesicle, right? So I didn't show you that, but you know, acidification is, is stochastic. So you, you can ask not what are, what are the kinetics of pumping, but what are the kinetics of the stochastic switching of the first event, right? And this kinetic extend over periods of 20 minutes. Right, so the, after 20 minutes, they're going to be vesicles that never acidified, and they're going to acidify for the first time 20 minutes after you added ATP. And then the question is, what is the life cycle of a synaptic vesicle? And, the, and there are different pools. The, 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 the life cycle of, uh, of synaptic vesicles start from, you know, a couple of seconds, and they go up to a couple of hours. So there are going to be some pools that will be heavily influenced by this, and some others that would be less. And this is assuming what you said, which is that neurotransmitters, once they're loaded, they don't leak, which is not clear at all. But even under this assumption. Very quick, maybe just a comment uh, from your side. The mechanism that you suggest um, means there's a lot of waste of energy. I mean, that you're pumping and then you, you leak at the same time. So what could be a biological function that you gain? I mean, you have faster response times or deacidification or something. That's a, it's a super good question. I, the, the, the truth is I don't really know the answer, but it, it, you know, I want to make a couple of comments. The first one is, you know, there is a misconception that biological systems have evolved to optimize energy consumption. That's not true. Like you said, they are happy, they are happy to waste energy providing they gain something, right? So I think, I don't know, but what, what is my guess, right? The waste that is produced through the stochasticity eventually creates heterogeneous populations of synaptic vesicles. That, that's what it does, right? So if this is present in an intact cell, it would suggest to me there is some advantage in not having all the synaptic vesicles being identical. And I wouldn't know what that is. Actually, I don't really have an answer to you, but it's a good question that you're asking. I just don't have the answer. Yeah. Okay, last quick question. Okay, that's scary. So I'm gonna, as a physicist, as a quantum person, I wanted to try and grasp a little bit more the relevance and the connection. So if, from my understanding, a somatic signal itself in the propagation from one yard to another is, an, is more than one vesicle. Is that correct? It, so it, it's a say, small numbers of vesicles physiologically. Okay. You know, it's like a, less than ten. Actually, okay, so, so my main question was: was if you have many vesicles, then of course, then the, any stochasticity in the filling of them in the propagation of the signal will be irrelevant. Uh, yes and no. Uh, it will always regulate the average amplitude of the transmission. Mm -hmm. That, that, so, and that's the amplitude of the transmission is very important. If half of your vesicles are empty, you have half the strength of transmission. That is very important. Now, on, on top, because in reality, you know, in, 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 when we do experiments in, uh, in culture with cultured cells, uh, 
we overexpress things and you know load them with synaptic vesicles and we have thousands exocytosis that's not physiologically in the brain it's a very small number so there the this stochasticity will also introduce will not just regulate the amplitude but it will also introduce temporal and and single cell uh, stochasticity heterogeneity because it's less than 10 okay so and is not very large it's not very large yeah all right, um, I would like to thank at this point again, you will be here for the rest of the time. So if you're interested in discussions, um, yeah, there is plenty of time to do that. Thank Absolutely. you again for the excellent talk.